My name is Yori Chang, and I'm the project manager for the Clean Slate for Worker Power Project at Harvard Law School's newly launched Center for Labor and a Just Economy. Thank you so much for joining us for today's event, A New Dialogue on Worker Power. Our webinar today will be recorded, and a video link will be available on our website following the event. Please feel free to share your thoughts on our discussion by using the hashtag WorkerPowerLaw, and we encourage you to visit our new website at clje.law.harvard.edu. For closed captioning, you can click on the CC button at the bottom of the screen. I'm happy to turn it over now to Sharon Block, Executive Director of the Center for Labor and a Just Economy. Good morning, everyone. And on behalf of the brand new Center for Labor and a Just Economy at Harvard Law School, I am so excited to welcome you to our virtual launch event, a new dialogue on worker power. I'm Sharon Block, as Yuri said, Executive Director of the Center for Labor and a Just Economy and a professor here at Harvard Law School. So we here at the center believe this is the perfect time to launch a new dialogue on worker power. There are head spinning cross currents for the US labor movement and efforts to build worker power in our country these days. As Dickens put it, it is the best of times and it is the worst of times. We have a remarkable wave of organizing across the country. Baristas are organizing at Starbucks, gamers are organizing at Microsoft, and geniuses are organizing at Apple. Those are words I never thought I would say together. Uh, and strikes are happening. Uh, according to a recent Bloomberg study, there was a big upswing in the number of strikes last year. And what is a strike? It's an expression of worker power. It is workers taking action to make their jobs, their companies, and our economy more fair. No coincidence, all of this great collective action is happening in the midst of the tightest labor market we've seen in decades. So that's all the good stuff. But at the same time, we see so clearly how our economy and democracy are failing the brave workers who are taking action or who want to take action or who are just so busy trying to make ends meet that they can't even think about taking action. Amazon and Starbucks are refusing to bargain with their workers even after they've had union elections. They are thumbing their corporate noses at NLRB findings that they have violated the law hundreds of times during these inspiring campaigns. And earlier this month, the Supreme Court held arguments in a case, Glacier Northwest, that could eviscerate the right to strike. And just last week, we learned from the Department of Labor that union density in our country is at a record low. That's the bad stuff. So what do we do when we have the public on our side, when we have workers in motion, when we see people playing by the rules and still not getting ahead, we figure out how to change the rules. That's why we've launched the Center for Labor and a Just Economy. We need new strategies to empower working people so they can demand a fair deal from the companies they work for and from the government that is supposed to serve them. Let's be clear, there has never been a successful democracy and a successful middle class without a successful labor movement. So now I wanna introduce my colleague, Professor Benjamin Sachs, who serves as the faculty co-director of the Center for Labor and Just Economy to share an overview of what we hope to accomplish at the center, Ben. Thanks, Sharon. So what we know is that we can't rely on the old playbook and there are no easy answers or quick fixes. That's why the Center for Labor and a Just Economy at Harvard Law School will be a place to build comprehensive, long-term approaches to facilitating worker organizing and constructing worker power. We will contribute to and draw on the newest and most important academic work on these questions, but we will also work in close collaboration with partners who view these challenges from multiple perspectives, from the campus to the halls of government to the workplace. And together we will find solutions that are undoubtedly ambitious, but also practical. Solutions that we think will be ambitiously practical. So what do we hope to accomplish? We'll be working on ideas for how states and localities can pass laws and enact programs that facilitate worker organizing and give workers more say in the decisions that govern their lives. All while we continue to press for our clean slate recommendations for comprehensive labor law reform at the federal level. And will be a resource for groups and policymakers that want to translate our ideas into action 
including worker, working on the future of industrial policy to ensure that we are taking advantage of every opportunity to give workers more voice in how the economy works. We were excited to see the work of one of these partners, One Fair Wage, in the spotlight just last week. We supported their work to create a worker-owned training program to compete with the National Restaurant Association's troubling monopoly on food handling training. As I'm sure many of you saw, this story was featured in the New York Times just a few days ago. We are already learning from labor movements across the country and around the world about what works best to encourage working people to be invested in the project of democracy. Is it making it easier for union members to run for office? Is it creating a tighter relationship between political parties and worker organizations? We plan to find out. We're bringing partners together to explore how working people can use technology to feel more connected while pushing back when employers use technology as a tool for surveillance and domination. And we are exploring what we might learn from labor about how law can help construct other forms of countervailing power among tenants, students, and debtors. Today, we have an amazing lineup of colleagues and friends to help get this new dialogue started. We've asked these great people to share their thoughts about how best to empower workers in 2023. What can each of us do? What should we hope to hear about in President Biden's State of the Union? Who should, be, who should we be watching to inspire us in the year to come? Sharon? Thanks, Ben. Before I introduce our first special guest, I wanna take a minute to thank all the people who helped us get to this day. Our wonderful CLJE staff and fellows, our colleagues at Harvard Law School, and our generous funders, Ford Foundation, Hewlett Foundation, Omidyar Network, W.K. Kellogg Foundation, Justice Catalyst, and Open Societies Foundation. We wanna thank you for really for your partnership and for believing in us and our vision. So now I wanna share video remarks from a great champion of working people. I am proud to call her a mentor, an inspiration, and my Senator, the Senator from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren. Hello to the Center for Labor and a Just Economy. I am so glad to have the chance to talk to you today. I wish I could be there in person to celebrate this really exciting occasion, but I wanna thank you for your tireless efforts over the last decades to empower working people. The Labor and Work Life Program, which is now the Center for Labor and a Just Economy at Harvard Law School, has been a critical hub of research and strategic thinking for the labor movement. Executive Director Sharon Block is also an incredible expert and a tireless advocate on behalf of workers, and I am proud to call her my friend. So I'm excited to keep working together with her and with all of you in the fight to lift up millions of working and middle-class families by making sure that workers in Massachusetts and workers all across this country get the wages, the rights, and the protections that they have earned. Today, I just wanna talk for a minute about some of our shared priorities. Over the past few years, workers across the country have been organizing in record numbers, from Starbucks to Amazon to university campuses, woohoo! Uh, workers are voting to unionize and bargain for better pay, better benefits, and better working conditions. And here is the good news, workers are winning. But that has not stopped companies from union busting. And they've come up with new ways to do it, from uh, surveilling workers' private messages for words like union or pay raise, to denying union shops key benefits like access to safe abortions or gender-affirming care. And some workers are still cut out of the deal altogether. Millions of workers are misclassified as independent contractors. These exploitive business models allow companies like Uber, Lyft, and Amazon to extract every cent from these workers without any guarantee of a minimum wage, overtime pay, the right to organize, or any of the other critical rights and protections that traditional employees get. 
So I was glad to see the Department of Labor's proposed rule on employee status, which will level the playing field for misclassified workers. But this also needs bold, proactive enforcement. Over the past two years, we've made a lot of progress to support workers and hold corporations accountable for abuses. But there is still a lot to do. And to get this fight across the finish line, we're going to have to do this together. The work you do here at the center is a key piece of the puzzle. So I just want to say again, I am excited to continue our critical work together. I want to thank you for all you have done, for all you are doing now, and for all you will be doing, and to say congratulations on the launch of the CLJE. Go! Great. Oh, so grateful to Senator Warren for uh, joining us and sending those remarks. So now we're going to transition to a conversation with a very special guest, another very special guest, Joelle Gamble. Joelle, thank you so much for joining us. It's wonderful to see you. As I said to Joelle earlier, I'm so excited to see her in her new office at the Department of Labor as a DOL alum. I'm just so excited that you are there with that great team that Secretary Walsh has put together. Uh, for all of you out there who don't have the, the honor of already knowing Joelle, you should, but she is uh, now the chief economist at the Department of Labor, came over to the department a little while ago after serving as special assistant to the president at the National Economic Council. We uh, found our way through day one just over two years ago. I can't believe it, um, after also having served on the, on the transition. Uh, so Joelle, this event is about looking forward, about trying to, to uh, predict maybe what's going to happen for workers in 2023. And we're hoping you could give us some context for that conversation. Um, what indicators in the economy do you think are most important in understanding sort of the, the waters that the Biden administration is going to have to navigate um, in the coming year? Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Ben. Thank you to the Center for Labor and a Just Economy team. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I know the DOL team is incredibly happy um, about this moment. Many people were just excited talking about it this morning. Um, and so, so I'm happy to be here and share you know, what insights I have about how we're thinking about the labor market um, in 2023. And to your question, um, Sharon, I think, I think a few kind of indicators uh, are, are important to trying to understand the economy and the labor market that we're in today. So one that I look at, frankly, is the quits rate, right? It's often a measure of labor market tightness, right? How hard is it for businesses to retain their workers, which also means that it can tell us something about how much choice workers have in the labor market, right? Can they you know, move jobs for better options, higher wages, better compensation, you know, better conditions. And so that's something that has been happening quite a bit over the last year and a half. And it's something that, so the quits rate is something that I've been watching. We often talk about openings, but I think the quits rate is actually a really important, important measure. This, the second is around real wages, right? We've been experiencing this period of, of high inflation, paychecks haven't stretched as far. And so tracking real wages tells us a lot about how far paychecks are stretching, um, how much purchasing power essentially workers have, which is so important. And frankly, lately, you know, real wages have been improving. Um, they are now higher than they were six months ago with the inflation report that we got maybe two weeks ago. Um, and so those are those are two. I would say two more, and, and I'll be brief. Um, you know, another is the unemployment rate, which I like to track by race and gender. Um, and, and that's important in part because, you know, we have a lot of systemic racism in the U.S. economy and institutions. And so black workers are often the canary in the coal mine when it comes to things like labor market softening. Um, and it's also important, I think, um, to get the unemployment rate down for black workers, workers of color, workers with disabilities, so that, you know, more families can have economic security and get access to good jobs. I mean, the fourth piece I would say is the long-term trends in labor force participation rate. So I would not say this is a real-time indicator, but it's something I'm thinking a lot about. You know, we spent a lot of time 
not investing, right? Decades we haven't invested in, in our people and workers. And this administration is really trying to turn that around, thinking a lot about workforce training. You know, we're gonna create a lot of jobs with the legislation that's been passed, thinking a lot about access to care, mental health, access to employment for justice involved individuals, and frankly, investing in communities that have been blighted by globalization. And so all these sorts of things, um, affect you know the labor supply so i think looking at the long-term trend in, in, in lfpr is an important way to try to hold ourselves accountable to some of these bigger structural changes that we want to make that will help people it's fascinating thank you i really i love that now i know what to look for i know quit <laughs> right that's jolt report comes out thursday mornings everybody check bls <laughs> but uh thanks so much okay so all of these, this complicated data, and it feels like there are a lot, as we sort of talked about in the opening a couple of minutes ago, a lot of cross currents and complexities um, in the economy today, sort of post-pandemic conditions, um, high but declining, important to say, declining inflation, low unemployment, as you just, um, as you just noted, war in Ukraine, in Ukraine, which creates uncertainties, so in thinking about this, this complex um, world that we're living in, we hear the Biden administration come back again and again to how important it is for the president to deliver on his promise to be so pro-union. I mean, we've all, those of us, I think, who follow these issues, we've all heard him say that he believes he is the most pro-union president um, since FDR maybe ever. Can you share with us from, from your economist perch, why pushing for those pro-union policies is so important to this administration and, and how you see that playing out in the coming year? Sure, sure. Um, it's a great question. And I think, you know, to your point about just the complexities in today's economy, it's so important to think of the economy as a real thing, right? Um, sometimes it can just seem like a series of numbers flashing across your TV screen, um, but, you know, it is a real thing, right? Because we experience it in a real way, and that's been, you know, you know, punctuated by the inflation we've experienced, been experiencing. Though there's signs of light in the inflation story today, falling gas prices, you know, with the exception of eggs, you know, cooling grocery prices, you know, major cooling in, in goods as supply chain disruptions ease. People felt that in a real way, and you know, they will start to feel the increasing purchasing power for workers that we started to see over the last six months. Um, and the fact that the economy is also a real thing, I think underscores the importance of this administration's focus on workers and small businesses in the recovery, right? So that means we've had a really strong labor market comeback, two of the largest years for job growth on record. Um, and that also means that we're in a strong position given the headwinds as you've alluded to in the global economy today. Um, but that's important uh, also to think of the economy as a real thing when we talk about, frankly, how workers fare in the labor market in the long run. The economy is a real thing. That means workers need real power, you know, in their workplace, real power in the labor market in order to achieve longer term, you know, positive economic outcomes. In this recovery, we've seen workers who are able to switch industries for better jobs, better compensation, right? Um, and that may have led to some, you know, reduction in wage income inequality. There's a paper by David Otter, um, Dubay and McGrew, who, um, who, who measure some of this, but at the same time, it needs to be a constant, right? So we need, you know, unions, right? Which are a key institution, a key, mechanism for, for workers to have collective action, the ability to collectively improve their outcomes in order to make sure that we start to see, you know, more of that durable, you know, increase in workers, workers purchasing power, increase in options in the workplace, better benefits, right? All of the good things that come with unions um, in, in the long term. That's great, thank you. All right, so so as we talked about in the opening, there's there's some things to be positive about there are a lot of um, uh, pressures and, and challenges for workers building power for succeeding in this economy. But you know, we really want to, we, we want to give people reasons to be optimist, optimistic. So what are you optimistic about in the year to come? Um, I think the first thing that I'm optimistic about is not, you know, some economic statistic, but just the fact that, you know, I just believe in the American worker, right? That like through all of the, the crises that we face, workers are still incredibly resilient, right? They're willing to organize for better outcomes, right? They're willing to help each other. And so that's like top line, always what, what keeps, keeps me going and makes me optimistic about what we can do. Um, and then more specifically, you know, I think I'm optimistic about 
the world to come because, you know, a lot of people, including people who are listening on this call, worked hard to create investments that are going to lead to economic, you know, opportunity in the labor market, right? Jobs in manufacturing, in construction, right? All these jobs coming from the infrastructure law, from the Inflation Reduction Act, et cetera. And so, you know, that means that there's room for the Department of Labor to work with our agency partners to make sure these are good paying jobs and that workers have the right to join a union at these jobs. Um, so that's one thing that makes me really optimistic. Um, the second is the energy of the labor movement right now. Um, you know, people are really leaning on collective, out, uh, collective action to improve their outcomes, which is so important, as we've been saying, to build worker power. Um, and while, as you alluded to, we've seen this huge spike in interest, it's been hard for workers to get to first contract because of all the barriers that are often put up for them. But, you know, we are really committed to making sure that that, that workers have, you know, that right um, that they are trying to exercise. And so the Department of Labor also has a work center, which is a resource for workers who are trying to organize and um, to be able to learn about their rights, learn about, um, you know, how they can actually organize collectively. Um, so folks should check that out. And then, you know, the last thing I would say is I do think in this moment where we've been focusing a lot on supply chains and what that means for goods and the price of goods at the store, I think folks are now realizing just how important workers are to actually making the economy go. I think the people on <laughs> this call know this very well, but I think more and more people are starting to realize that as we make investments on making the American economy competitive, workers are absolutely central to that. And so we need to invest in, you know, in their education, including things like apprenticeships, you know, their ability to make choices in their in their lives, including having access to care and the ability to find a good jobs and frankly to join a union. And so I think that kind of attention on the centrality of workers to the future of the US economy is there. And so I'm excited to see what we can do with it. Thank you, Joelle. You've really given us a lot to be optimistic about, and I really appreciate that. I will tell you one thing I'm optimistic about is the fact that you are there at Department of Labor and just you know having the privilege of knowing a lot of members of the the DOL team and the econ team um, in this administration um, that that does help me feel some optimism so thank you so much again for joining us um, we really appreciate it send my best to, to all your colleagues well Great. Okay, now we are going to transition to a panel discussion on this topic, and I am going to turn it over to Eleanor Muller, a reporter for Politico. And I'm sure many people on this call start their Monday mornings the same way I do, which is reading Morning Shift, which, which Eleanor is the author of. If you don't, I'm just, this is unsolicited plug. You really should. You'll know what to expect during the week. So Eleanor, thank you so much for joining us. And I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Sharon, for that introduction. Um, as Sharon said, you know, my name is Eleanor and I am a reporter at Politico covering labor. I'm so excited to be here for the launch of the new center and flattered to be counted among these, you know, incredibly intelligent, accomplished people. Uh, we're going to be moving to a conversation with some very exciting guests. We're going to talk about organized labor and labor policies and, you know, what we can expect in the next couple of years, particularly with our Congress obviously shifting. Um, joining me, we've got Becky Pringle, who is the president of the National Education Association. Uh, president Pringle was a middle school science teacher for three decades and is now focused on using her voice to unite the members of what is actually the largest labor union. Becky, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Eleanor. Also joining us is Jose Garcia, who is the director of the Future of Workers team at the Ford Foundation. Uh, he served as a program officer and a senior program officer since 2017, leading Ford's efforts to support organizations innovating new ways to build worker voice. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Jose. Thank you for having me. Last but not least, we've got Benjamin Sachs, who is the faculty co-director of the Center for Labor and a Just Economy, as well as the Kestenbaum Professor of Labor and Industry at Harvard Law School. As an expert in the field of labor law and labor relations, Professor Sachs teaches courses in labor law and writes on union organizing in American politics. Thank you so much, Ben, for joining us for this panel and also for having me today. Thanks for being here. Awesome. So we're going to jump into it. I got a, we've got a lot of questions from listeners. We're going to get to those. I want to start out for with one question for each of you. And, you know, President Pringle will begin with you. 
Uh, as Joelle mentioned, you know, just before this, we did find out last week that union membership in the United States last year actually dipped. And to clarify, you know, we did add more unionized workers, but the rate went down. And so how do we weigh that fact against, you know, anecdotally, there's a ton of evidence that workers are more excited about unionizing. We actually, we have the numbers. The NLRB has received more election petitions in the last fiscal year than they did the year before that significantly. Um, so, you know, particularly as president of the largest labor union, how do you, how are you weighing those two facts and how are they, you know, informing your path forward? So um, let me let me begin by saying thank you, Eleanor, for um, uh, the work that you do. I'm so glad you joined us in this space and you're moderating us. Um, uh, let me let me begin by uh, uh, talking about the um, uh, priorities, the the strategies that we are here at the NEA are using, and then I'll kind of go into that a little bit. Um, uh, we are looking at it at the NEA uh, from a place of what is impacting potentially that dip in the literally the numbers or in our market share with within education and so we're doing we've done a lot of research on uh, exactly what's causing that in this moment uh as i'm sure i don't need to tell anyone um on this panel or anyone listening um uh, we are edu we are experiencing a huge educator uh, shortage and that's a whole different panel eleanor <laughs> We should talk about, um, but we are focused uh, with, at the NEA on strategies around advocating and organizing, expanding educator voice. Uh, we are working uh, specifically on creating, on accelerating our, our, our craft union-like approach to educator recruitment and support and excellence and retention. Um, we are focused on increasing our resources and harnessing other resources from foundations, et cetera, um, uh, uh, being deployed for, for specifically for uh, labor organizing. Uh, we're standing in solidarity darity with other uh, labor unions and labor writ large worker centers, et cetera, focused on organizing and learning from each other. And of course, we're continuing to partner with academia. And, and that gives me the opportunity, Ben, to just say uh, congratulations. I, I'm just, I'm excited that we had the opportunity to any partner with you for the last five years. Um, and it's not insignificant that you've changed your name uh, to the Center for Labor and uh, a Just Economy, because we here in labor understand the connection between those two things, that that uh, centering everything we, we, we do and we talk about injustice for, injustice for our students, for our educators, for our communities, for uh, this country, and all of them is dependent dependent on um, a just a just economy. So I want to congratulate you on that, and particularly focused on uh, ideas, generating ideas, um, and and focused on action. So uh, we look forward to that continued uh, partnership. For us, we are looking at this moment, this opportunity with the administration. First of all, being able to say the word union. Can I just can I just um, repeat what what Joelle said? We need unions. Thank you, Joelle. Yes, we do. This country needs unions. Our economy needs unions. Of course, our workers need uh, that collective voice and advocacy so that they not only can um, participate in a just economy, but they have just working conditions in education that we are able to um, use our expertise, our, our, our professionalism to actually make teaching and learning decisions for our students another uh, can I just say, Eleanor, another panel, there's another panel, then a whole other panel, the politicization of, of education, what in the world's going on in Florida, AP courses, uh, all the stuff, all the stuff is landing um, right at our feet. And for us as a labor union, we know the power of our collective voice. And we are not only focused at the federal level, of course, that bully pulpit that's coming at the federal level, uh, the support for unions is absolutely essential. And there are policies that uh, we are promoting and, and will continue to promote that will happen there. But, but I will tell you, Eleanor, as we address that, that 
what what's what whichever sector you're in, whether there's a dip or not, as we address worker rights writ large, we have got to we have got to address it from what I've uh, been calling. Um, a place of dynamic alignment. It cannot only be at the federal level. It's got to be at the state level. It's got to be at the local level. We've got to build the systems, processes, and structures to support collective bargaining, collective action, collective voice at every single level of government so that the action that um, C C CLJE is talking about is taking place in a dynamic an aligned way that will result in our workers not only being paid what they are what they are worth in in our case what we believe is commensurate with the important work world our educators play in this society but that they have safe working conditions for their students and for themselves and that they will have that voice to protect our democracy I'm glad, yeah, I'm glad that you bring up that bully pulpit because we are going to circle back to that when we talk about Biden's State of the Union, which is coming up soon. Um, the, the next question, you know, Jose, I wanted to ask you, uh, we've spoken about this at this event already today, but there was a real rebalancing of power, I think, during the pandemic. We saw, you know, some of the power taken out of the hands of employers, given back to workers. Wages went up, the labor market tightened, you know, there were all of these factors that contributed to people having a little bit more choice, like Joelle mentioned. Um, and I'm curious to hear from you as someone whose, you know, work centers on worker voice, as things start to revert back to normal, and maybe some of that power is starting to be taken back from workers, uh, what is the Ford Foundation and other organizations like it doing to, again, protect that worker voice? Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you for the invitation. I'm very, we're very excited of this, the launch of the Center for Labor and Just Economy. Um, so very excited to be here with Benjamin and Sharon Block as part of this. Um, and thank you for being part of the panel. My name is Jose Garcia, and I'm the director of the Future Workers Team. I mean, let me just start with like, I, I agree with you, Eleanor, the, the tightening of the labor market clearly have a huge implication during COVID and clearly have implications for workers. And the, the normality, right, uh, that we're seeing uh, based on the past decade is that we have workplaces that have been transformed by globalization, by corporate concentration, financialization, and the continuing increase of the future workplace, right? And these are patterns that have continued, we have seen it through our grantees. In addition to that, that Sharon mentioned is that we have seen emerging technologies as an institution, intelligence, robotics, big data, that are playing increasingly an important role in shaping the jobs of the future. Um, unfortunately, these jobs have been changing traditional employment and beginning to look more like gigs, right? With un unpredictable work schedules and, and more precarious worker conditions. So for us, how do we ensure that we have a broad economy that actually create, have the policy infrastructure that actually center power as part of this? And I think my voice, Lino, I'm gonna fix my audio because it's, uh, it's a usual issue here with my Zoom. I think now it should be working fine, right? Yeah, that's much better. Excellent, thank you. So we wanna make sure that as we center our policy that actually center worker power, is that we want to make sure that workers are protagonists of our economy, that we ensure that workers equal rights to labor protection, social protection, that are decoupled from work status, but are guaranteed for all, and that worker can shape the policy and economy of our life. So what are we excited about? Clearly is the work of our right? Um, we have seen all over the nation clear the movement of workers from Starbucks workers, as was mentioned, Amazon workers and others. But in addition to that, we already have seen the work that um, Andy Carr, nail salon workers actually are organizing across the United States, um, actually pushing legislation that actually ensure that we create industry councils, maze of workers, employee and government officials. We have seen in Harris County, the Harris County Essential Workers Board. This is part of, uh, of during COVID and the Essential Worker Bill of Rights is the first of its kind in the United States and will aim to establish formal roles of worker and determine workplace health and safety uh, as part of this organization like United for Respect, Workers Defense Projects, Job with Justice, FEA and Justicia Worker Center and National Domestic Worker Alliance were an important part of this. 
we have continued to see the work that the bargaining for common good have been be doing um, and ensuring and we need to find ways that workers and community are working together for a common effort that are rooted beyond the workplace, right? That the idea of collective bargaining, I think as, as was mentioned by Sharon, is actually con constructed as an idea that is go beyond the workplace, that it helps us to negotiate with those with more power, right? That our communities. And I think the bargaining for common good have ensured to do that. We have grantees like co-workers and Jay with Jay that are ensuring um, in raising money for the more organic work that is happening, ensuring that we actually have the resources and the capacity to help um, organi uh, organic organizing of workers around the country also, uh, which are uh, very important. So as you see, we have workers around the country testing and building a new, ensuring that we have a, a robust but innovative labor movement, a work labor movement that actually include all workers, that include immigrant workers that include racial minority workers, which is actually at the heart of this conversation, which is how do we ensure we have a, a infra policy infrastructure that includes those that have been historically excluded due to gender realities or racial realities, right? That are important for us. Um, and we have many grantees working in this arena. How do the other key area that we making, uh, putting a lot of effort is in the care issue uh, care area. How do we ensure that we have organizations and, and the infrastructure that we need, not only to ensure that care workers are properly paid, but care workers actually have are accessible to all families across the United States uh, at the same time. And we think about the industrial policy as, as, is, as an important that actually ensure the proper worker condition for our workers. And we can see care as another important part of it, thinking about industrial policy. So these are some of the examples uh, that some of our grantees have been experimenting to ensure that we have a stronger, not only stronger labor protection, but I think as Becky have mentioned, we have a stronger democracy and a, and a stronger economy for all our workers and, and, and the consumers. Yeah. Uh, ben, I mean, the next question is uh, for you from a listener, which is, I think, relevant to both what, uh, you know, Becky and Jose were talking about. How does the center plan to engage with the labor movement moving forward? Yeah, so thanks. That's a, that's a great question. And, and I really, I think, I'll just amplify things that President Pringle and Jose have said already. Um, you know, one way to think about this moment in in uh, in history, in the history of the labor movement, in the history of the economy, is it's a moment of a of a terrible disconnect between what workers want and what workers can get. And what workers want is to be in unions, and they can't get there. Um, it, some of them get there through heroic struggle, um, and we see that in you know in Amazon and 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 Starbucks today. Um, but if you believe the Pew poll, 70% of Americans support unions, more than 50% of Americans want to be in a union, and 6% of, of workers in the private sector are in a union. So how do we bridge that gap? How do we, how do we get from what workers want to, to what they actually have? And um, for us at CLJE, a big part of the answer, not the whole answer, but a big part of the answer is labor law and labor policy. Uh, the labor law we have is supposed to be a transmission belt for translating worker preferences into workplace realities, but it's a disaster and it's not a transmission belt. It's what, what Becky described as a series of roadblocks. So employers can interfere with you, with workers' ability to make a choice. Um, workers don't get the uh, opportunity to learn from union organizers what the advantages of a union are. And workers who are brave enough to, to, to try to form a union tend to get fired. And, and the workers who manage to, to make it across this, this sort of um, uh, pitch battle of, of unionization end up without a contract nine times out of 10. And so what we need is a new system of, of labor law. And that uh, ultimately what CLJE is about um, is, is thinking big, big and broad uh, about how to redesign American labor law. And, and um, you know, to, to echo again something Becky said, um, the Clean Slate Project sketched out what a new labor law would look like at the federal level. Um, we're going to continue to work on that. But we think that a lot of the 
uh, progress over the next handful of years has to come at the state and the city level. And so a lot of our efforts is going to be about thinking about how to how to make labor law reform possible uh, at the state and city level uh, as a theoretical matter, as a legal matter, and then engaging with our partners who are on the ground, like in Harris County, Jose, um, uh, and, and, and across the country to, to make these things possible um, for, for workers. And then the last thing I'll say, just again, to echo what's been said already, um, is this is about economics. This is about economic equity. It's about inclusion, absolutely, in the economic sphere, but it's also about politics and democracy. Because just as our economy is broken and just as our economy is skewed uh, disproportionately, radically disproportionately to the wealthy, so too is our, our politics. And the, the, the desire and the, the motivation to build a labor law that works for working people is an economic project, but it is also a political project. It is also a project that is deeply about uh, democracy. I mean, again, we're going to wrap up, I think, with a question for all three of you. I want to hear all of your takes on this. And that is, you know, what the path forward is for that labor law that you're describing, Benjamin. I mean, we obviously have a Republican controlled House now. Uh, Congress, even under Democratic control of the Senate, never actually took the PRO Act, which is Democrats, you know, pro union reform bill that would make it easier to join a union uh, to the floor. And so, particularly ahead of President Biden's State of the Union in just a few weeks, um, what do all of you see as the path forward for? pro-union labor reform like the PRO Act? And Becky, we'll start with you. Um, so I just want to then add, it is, it, it, this, it, this is also about racial and social justice in this country. And we need to be really clear about that. Um, Jose uh, talked a little bit about that. It's about centering everything in a just in a just society. So I just wanted to add that. Um, uh, so um, uh, you're absolutely right, Eleanor. We've been fighting for the PRO Act, and of course that's, that that focuses mostly on on private sector. Um, and and by the way, it's one of the things that we and the public sector continue to uh, lift our voices around. It led to the Department of Labor actually changing um, who was eligible for the uh, registered apprenticeships, so that it that it included educators and not just teachers. By the way. It's our education support professionals too. Um, them lifting their voices around uh, raising a teacher and other educators' salary, all of those things. And we believe that the federal government has got to not only use their, 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 their bully pulpit and policies, but when, when they actually take action, the implementation is so critical. So for example, if they say, um, and by the way, you must partner with your unions, they can't just say that we work really hard, for example, to codify that into language, that they would work with their local unions, but we realize now that they that we actually have to put teeth in that, that our local and state unions must sign, must be part of it and sign off on it. And that the federal government can withhold funding if they don't do that. That's those are that's kind of teeth in those policies. Um, um, but you know what, um, Eleanor, you asked uh, Joelle a really important question. This is really important because we always have to believe in the plausibility of the possible. So you asked her what she is, what she's optimistic about. And I loved her answer that she's optimistic. She believes in workers. So do I. I believe in their ability to collectively act across sectors and never stop lifting up their voice right there in Massachusetts, right? Look what we did. Fair taxes, we did that. Our, our state affiliate there in Massachusetts, MTA, is going for legislation to allow, allow them to strike. And we saw that collective action in Massachusetts and Washington. We saw the Red for Ed movement a couple of years ago, where even in non-bargaining non states, workers were rising up and telling their stories, and it was making a difference. I have that hope and that belief in our workers all over this country to do just that, to help us not only um, uh, create those opportunities for collective action, but to expand collective bargaining rights at every single level in every state, red or blue. And they can only do that 
by collectively acting, in our case, ensuring that every student, every student, everyone has the right to live into their brilliance. Thank you. Uh, Jose, I'm curious to hear your, it sounds like, I mean, President Pringle, you think the solution is originating this power with workers at every level of government, you know, not just obviously Congress. Uh, Jose, I mean, what is your take on the path forward for labor law reform, uh, particularly with the divided Congress? Yes, um, I think that we, I, I want to say like the idea of worker voice and continue to leave worker voice, I think is an important part of the administration job. I will say that the implementation of our three main, the, well, some people call it three sisters, the three great industrial policy uh, is important. While we have some incentives that have come out from uh, the administration, it's still, I go back to Becky's point, ensuring and the enforcement of what we have on the book and making making stronger in which we ensure that labor and community are part of the table as these, uh, as these dollars actually go to states and locality is critical. We actually can see if done properly and actually workers continues to be uh, lifting their voices, we can see a sea change of organizing across the nation, continuously see across the nation. The last point I will feel in Eleanor is enforcement, NLRB enforcement. Uh, we hope that labor standard enforcement agency will use their prosecutorial discretion with more frequency and regularity and grant defer action or parole and provide employment authorization so workers can support themselves during dispute processes. Um, and this is something that is procedural, that is in the hands of these agencies. So we hope that they actually also use their, their departmental power to continue to ensure that workers are at the forefront of our economy. Benjamin, last but not least, what is your take on all of this? Obviously, the center is launching at a you know highly pivotal moment for labor law reform. What do you see as, as uh, the path forward here? Yeah, I, I think it's two kinds of trends, one having to do with expansion and one having to do with devolution. So the expansion is a point about inclusion. Um, so since the beginning, American labor law has been uh, uh, plagued by exclusionary uh, policies, uh, agricultural workers, domestic workers, pr primarily black and women workers have been excluded. Immigrant workers have been excluded. Independent contractors have are now excluded. And so the way forward is towards inclusion. Um, and that's that was the grounding of the Clean Slate Project. And I think that remains a sort of core principle for the Center for Labor and a Just Economy. Another form of broadening is uh, broadening towards uh, sectoral bargaining. So we've had uh, too long in this country disaggregated organizing campaigns, workplace by workplace by workplace, forces workers to do just too much work to organize uh, for power. And I think we need to begin to think, at, um, like the FAST Act in California, about organizing workers on a sectoral basis. So instead of having uh, McDonald's on 42nd Street in a union, you have the whole fast food industry in a union. And 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 then the question is, who gets this done? And again, to, to repeat, I think, things that Becky and, and Jose and I have said already, um, the federal government is great. We need to keep working at the federal level, but I think that the real progress on inclusion and on expansion is going to come through uh, making policy possible at the state and local level. Thank you so much, all three of you. I mean, I <laughs> speaking for myself, at least, this conversation could have gone twice as long. So obviously, we've barely even, you know, dipped down below the surface of the water on this iceberg. But thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I'm going to pass it back to Sharon so she can uh, wrap us up. Excellent. And I really just want to thank, again, our amazing panelists. That was just inspiring conversation. And that's really what today is about, is looking to the future. And so thank you, thank you, thank you to Becky, Jose, and Ben. Um, and so Ben and I are going to are just going to close this out. I'm going to turn it over to Ben just for a few concluding remarks. Yeah, thanks. I, and really, all I, I, I want to say is thank you, everybody, for joining uh, today. Thanks to our great panelists and to Senator Warren for her remarks. Uh, as we heard from our experts, while there are still strong headwinds 
for workers trying to build power. Um, there are also reasons to be optimistic about the prospects for progress. Um, that's the sweet spot for CLJE, bringing people together to solve really hard problems with innovative solutions that generate reasons to be optimistic about the future of our economy and our democracy. So we see today as just a start or maybe a restart to a conversation that we want to continue with all of you who joined us and your friends, your family, your coworkers. <laughs> to that end, we ask you to all go to our website. That's www.clje.law.harvard.edu to keep the conversation going. We actually have a survey posted there where you can share with us your answers to two questions, one or two questions, whatever you want to do. First is what's the most important conversation that the center can host in 2023? So be part of our, um, our development of the center. And then two, what strategy or campaign do you think holds the most promise for empowering workers in 2023? We really want to hear from you. So please go to the website, share your ideas, stay in touch. And uh, we look forward to, to talking with all of you. So thanks again and talk soon.